All right, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our Living Room Lecture Series tonight. Thank you for joining us. We have Ashes from Ashes, Archaeologists and Forensic Dogs Recovering Lost Human Remains by Natalie Brody. My name is Stephanie Sandoval, and I'm the Deputy Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. Um, just a few announcements before we get started. Um, in case you've missed any of our past Living Room Lectures, you can now join us every second Saturday starting in July at the Center Classroom, and we will have two screenings each Saturday, no reservations necessary. So we have up first um, the Archaeology and History of Torrey Pine State Natural Reserve by Kathy Dickey, and also the Polynesian Contact with the Americas, uh, an update by Terry Jones. So that will be July 9th is when those screenings start at the Center. Also, July 31st is the application deadline for the Shetler Women in Archaeology Fund. So if you're interested in that, um, please check out the website for more information about the Shetler Fund, information on the center, our curation efforts and programs. Um, all of that can be found on our website. Tonight, as always, we'll be using the Q&A feature. You can find that on your Zoom control panel. Feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation, but we will answer them. Natalie will answer them. Um, at the end during a moderated Q&A. So I'm very excited to um, introduce Natalie Brody. Um, I have known Natalie since we worked together in Jordan almost 20 years ago. And since then, she's been a professional archeologist working her way around Southern California. She is currently a senior archeologist at AECOM. Um, and in 2018, she started working with the Cremains Recovery. And so we we're excited to hear about this important work from her. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Natalie. Thanks, Stephanie. It was a sunny day, mid-afternoon in late December. I was looking out at the trees, enjoying the crisp air. And I bring my attention back to my clipboard and the woman standing next to me. We were standing at the corner of what was her home in what was her neighborhood in what was the town of Paradise. We continued on our task. She explained that her father's ashes were kept in a coffee can and that she had found those already. And I asked, making some notes in my paperwork. Um, and what kind of container were your mother's ashes kept in? She turned to me and said, kind of making a shape with her hands, a Chinese takeout box. So let me back up a minute. Yes, we were in paradise following the campfire. And why were we here? We, say we, a team of archeologists and a cremains recovery dog and handler, were on site to recover the cremated remains of our client's parents. While we chuckled at, at her response, our client explained where they might be. And Annie, who was, our, who was our recovery dog, teamed with us that day, gave us a couple more areas to check a little bit more thoroughly. We found some of the ashes and bagged them relatively quickly. I asked where to place the bags and our client and her husband gestured to the tailgate of their pickup truck. And the husband paused and looked at, the, looked at the bags sitting on the back of the truck. And he says, well, I guess she's twice baked now. So what I'm gonna talk about for the next so 35 minutes or so, my observations and experiences doing the volunteer work, recovering cremated remains in areas affected by wildfires and just how I think this is a very unique application of archeological skills to a very specific need. So when I think about responders to major disasters and catastrophic wildfires, and to be honest, when most people think about responders to disasters, um, of course, archeologists are never on that list. <laughs> but it's time, I think, to reconsider just what we have to offer. There's a very special need that arises following wildfires providing an opportunity to recover remains that had been considered lost and provide some hope to people who are feeling very hopeless. Here's a, a quick map showing some of the largest and deadliest wildfires in California in the past few years. 
Um, I wanted to show the North Bay firestorm location north of San Francisco, as it was one of the first fires where this type of recovery was performed. I know there were some phone calls and back and forth to basically say, well, what do you think? We've used the search and rescue dogs to identify historical burials and some prehistoric burials. And maybe these dogs can help us find recent cremated remains. Um, otherwise, they'll end up in a landfill. So Alex DeGiorgi and Mike Newland and Lynn Engelbert and Adela Persick gave it a shot. And wow, was it successful. <laughs> um, so we've used this process now on several other fires and have had an incredible recovery rate. Uh, the two fires in bold here, the campfire and the Southern Oregon complex, are where I spent most of my time doing the volunteer work. And so all the stories I'm going to be sharing tonight will be from those two locations. I'm not a forensic anthropologist or the coroner. So what could I possibly have to offer here? Well, to start, archaeologists have a good understanding of the site formation process, how layers of debris can easily, easily obscure other layers, um, and how, you know, how, are, how can I actually identify cremated human remains? The nature of cremated remains is tricky. They often blend in with other ash, drywall, books, wood, etc. cetera, falling, anything that burns basically <laughs> during the fire. However, they often present as a different color, a different texture, um, a different density, much like different soil and stratigraphic layers in archaeological sites. And at this point, if you're thinking to yourself, gee, Natalie, I can tell the difference in soil colors and textures. We always need volunteers, and I'll ask you to visit our website at the end here. Uh, the Institute for Canine Forensics provide, provides the, the dogs and the handlers that we work with for these recoveries. Some of you may have worked with um, ICF on burial identification projects in the past. And, but the dogs also help us for this effort, helping us identify cremated remains despite being buried or mixed with other debris. Um, Annie is the dog in the bottom right photo and she's my best friend. <laughs> she also worked on some of the first recoveries following the campfire, um, including finding a bag of crem cremated remains that a client had put um, and the backseat of her car when fleeing paradise. And if any of you remember all the stories coming out of, coming out of paradise at that time, there were lines of cars and traffic, um, basically people being unable to, to get down the road to safety. And so this woman had to abandon her vehicle and basically run down the hill. And so all the cars that were destroyed in the fire on the road and on the road were taken to a scrap or a junkyard afterwards. So all the cars looked the same in this in this in this lot, burned, and broken and nearly unidentifiable. But Annie was on the case and she searched the roads until she lay down on the ground next to the remains of a vehicle and the ashes were still in the back seat of the car and were successfully recovered. And that I was really proud to work with Annie after that. Archaeologists bring many skills to this effort and our extensive catalog of search images to identify human remains is um, useful for us. We're a great fit for this, but the prospect of doing recoveries blindly is daunting and quite overwhelming. Um, and this is where the dogs are a perfect complement. They're able to focus amidst this chaotic scene and can hone in on what we can't even see yet. So the combination of professional search and rescue dogs that have been trained on the scent of cremated human remains, plus experienced and enthusiastic archeological volunteers yields an extremely complimentary partnership. And at this point, if you're thinking to yourself, gee, Natalie, I like dogs make sure you visit our website, which I'll show you at the end of the presentation. So how this works, a dog or two and their handler and a handful of volunteer archeologists act as a team to visit homes that have been destroyed by wildfire for a one to four 
or more, our attempt to recover cremated remains at the request of our clients. We meet with the client or the homeowner, typically on site or via FaceTime, as you can see here in these photos. Um, we have a conversation about who we're looking for, what kind of container the ashes were kept in, where the ashes were located within the house, etc. cetera. Um, for me, this is a very, a delicate balance of professionalism and approachability, requiring an understanding of human nature and human behavior, like, our, like anthropology. Um, here's an example of an interview in progress. And here is a picture of Annie hard at work. I think this really sums up one of the main reasons why I was out there. Some of the folks I talked to thought that they would be okay leaving their family members ashes on site. Like they wouldn't want to leave their home or this place. So why take them away uh, when but then when they find out that the remediation process for cleaning areas following wildfire includes basically scooping everything up with a bulldozer and taking it as hazardous waste to a dump site made them change their minds and really want to recover the remains. So what often results in these recovery efforts is, a, is an intense or intimate experience best described as an emotional roller coaster that has given me a new purpose for my skill set. The best way for me to convey what that experience is like is to walk you through a handful of these recoveries. Sometimes we get lucky. We were on site here to recover two sets of cremated remains, one in an urn and another one in a wooden box, both of which were inside an old steamer trunk. So I didn't include any photos, but another benefit of having an archeological background is being able to identify parts and pieces of objects, say metal straps and wood from a steamer trunk to help narrow down our search area. And there's the arrow is there is pointing to uh, the remains that were in the box inside the steamer trunk. A uh, quick note on archeological methods here, when we do identify a location that possibly contains the cremated remains, we'll sort of pedestal the area like you do for a feature in an excavation unit. Uh, so we start from the outside, the largest extent, and then we work towards the middle where we think the ashes are located. Here's an example of a pedestal area with the arrow and the medallion from the cremation that was in the center of that pile. One more example of another pedestaled area, and this one I remember well. We were looking for the remains of our client's husband, which had been kept in a box near her bed. While I talked to our client, she explained to me that her husband had wanted his ashes to be kept with the remains of their loyal and very well-loved family dog. And she told me how she had spoken to the mortuary and while it was against the rules technically to include the ashes of a dog to be cremated with a human, she was able to sneak them in. And uh, we found the medallion for this one too, confirming the identification of the remains. This was a two-story apartment building and we were looking for our client's husband whose ashes were kept in a wooden box on top of a dresser. We first had to clear the debris from the upper story, which you can see here. This particular one was the first for me to show just how much things shift during a fire. And we found clear evidence of the dresser, including other trinkets and jewelry, including some jade items, which were remarkably unblemished by going through a fire, um, some clothes and pieces of a particularly nice cable knit sweater. Um, but we could not find the ashes near the dresser. 
we got down to the bright red soil, the native soil in that area, nothing. So we kept moving, kept moving north towards what was the, what was left of the bed frame and bingo. The ashes were under the rail of the bed frame and had traveled all the way across the room during the fire. We approached this site to meet a couple to recover the ashes of their son, which were kept next to other family keepsakes in the hallway. The husband was extremely skeptical and stopped short of calling our search attempt a total waste of time and paced around the outside of the house while Annie worked, our dog, and while we were working. I walked over to the wife and asked about her son who tragically died from a horrible illness that took him before he even started college. I could tell that she wanted to talk to someone, anyone who would listen about how wonderful her son had been and how fearful they were that they would not be able to collect his ashes. I looked back at the team and I walked over and they looked up and said quietly, bingo. So I turned to the mom and I said quietly, we found him. And she burst into tears and her husband looked down at, at Annie and cuffed her neck and just started sobbing into her fur. This was the first time I was asked to be in a group photograph and had very mixed feelings about it. Like why, why would they wanna remember this horrible thing that had happened, but realized that they wanted some kind of a, a memento marking our entry into their lives and, and marking a part of their story. So I got over my discomfort. When we approached this site, we were look, looking for the ashes of our client's father-in-law. They are kept in a suitcase in the garage. And our, the father-in-law had been incarcerated until he died and was cremated in prison. And just below the layer of duff and leaves, we found a large pile of ashes in what had been the garage, which you can see here in the photo on the right. And here's the medallion from that cremation. And if I haven't mentioned it, and I know I haven't mentioned it, but the medallions are our definitive proof of a cremation recovery. And each cremation is provided with an identification tag that typically contains the name of the crematory and a unique ID number associated with the individual. It's never a name, but it is a unique number that can then be matched up with that person. Um, and here's a bonus photo of Annie alerting on the location of those cremated remains just to show off that, yes, she does know what she's doing. When we arrived at this location, um, our dog handler had arrived before us and she took me aside and said, she started crying like when I pulled up with a grimace on her face. And so I steeled myself for what was coming. <laughs> Quick aside, I have never been in a situation where a client was so happy to see the archeologist that they started crying. So if you're thinking to yourself, gee, Natalie, I'd like to be in a situation where a client is crying out of gratitude, please visit the Alta Heritage Foundation website. Um, so when I approached, our client said that she had not been able to, to sleep for the last two months, knowing that her husband was out there in the cold, in the rain, and in the snow. It had just been snowing. And that really strengthened my resolve to do our very best. We relatively quickly identified our husband's ashes that were... Um, had been sort of trapped and buried underneath um, a television that had fallen over during the fire. And um, when I told her that we had identified her husband's ashes, 
she began to cry again and was hugging her sister. And then she hugged all of us and told me that she would finally be able to sleep and hold her husband in her arms. And you could see I got over my reluctance to take group photos. And this is pretty great. The, the, our client um, is the one holding the bags and she's, her sister was taking the photo off camera and is actually holding Annie's toy off to the side so that you can, <laughs> so she could easily get Annie's attention. <laughs> Uh, when we arrived at this location, we met in the, we met our client in the parking lot, although it was her mother's apartment we would be searching. So she was available on the phone via FaceTime and gotta love new technology. <laughs> we were looking for a couple spoonfuls of ashes located on a small vessel described to us as a genie bottle. And we were not having any luck um, searching on one side of this wall and, and um, our client kept insisting that she knew that it was on the north side of the wall and we thought, well, you know, we know how things move. Um, so once we changed our strategy to move to the south side of the main wall of the house, we found this tiny jar and showed it to our client who held up her phone to show it to her mother, who put a hand over her mouth and said, that's it, and had a huge smile on her face. Now, to me, I don't, I don't know if I would describe that as a genie bottle, but I suppose the shape is similar to a genie bottle. We arrived on Happy Street here to recover the remains of our client's father. And as my team scraped and dug and poked around the I-beams of this mobile home, I could sense their resolve beginning to wane. And they looked up at me at a bit of a loss. And I focused on a single spot in front of a stack of cinder blocks. And I just knew that the ashes were there. And I scraped once, twice with my trowel and out popped the medallion. I looked over at our client who was talking to her mother on the phone about to relay the news that we could not find her father's ashes. When I looked up at her and I nodded and she this bumped in the air and released this wild whoop of joy and hurriedly explained to her mother that like, yes, we had found them. And she was just so thrilled and her excitement spilled over and we all laughed and cheered. And she was so grateful. And she came up to us afterwards and, and said that she had an Airbnb in Southern Oregon and that if we ever wanted to use it, if any of us ever wanted to use it, all we had to do was ask, and it was all ours. A few streets over in the same mobile home park, uh, we met with a gentleman who had asked us to find his wife and his mother-in-law. While the crew worked carefully, uh, again, around the I-beams in the mobile home, I asked about his wife. He told me that she had been diagnosed with cancer and they had managed to take a trip to Scotland and Ireland before she died, which was one of her lifelong wishes. He kept her ashes at the foot of his bed covered with her favorite scarf. And he told me that he talked to her every night and told her good night. And that was Sharon. His mother-in-law's ashes were kept in the hall closet and we recovered those as well in case you were concerned, although he was less concerned <laughs> about recovering his mother-in-law's ashes, but was also extremely grateful uh, that we were able to find those ones too. At this home, we were looking for um, the ashes for our client's father who had served in the army during World War II. His ashes were kept in a box in a closet in the hallway. While my team worked to expose the area around the ashes, I talked to the owner of the house and heard this 
a heartbreaking story of resilience. This current home, which burned during the campfire in 2018, was the second house built at that location. Um, while this couple lost their house in a fire a few years previously, they lived nearby in the rental home while this house was being rebuilt. Then the rental house burned down in a different fire and they were just able to move into the new rebuilt house, which subsequently burned down during the campfire. And I asked what they had, what they were planning on doing after, you know, after the campfire. And they said they would just rebuild again. And they did not want to leave paradise. Initially, I was overwhelmed by the photograph and the flowers left here. Um, it was our client's mother's birthday, just a, a day or two previous. Um, and her ashes were kept in the living room in a large ceramic container that had essentially exploded into hundreds of pieces during the fire. While we recovered as much of the ashes as we could, I was engaged in conversation with our client and his wife who talked about what an amazing woman his mother had been. And after we were done, he made a couple of phone calls and told us to go up the road to the, the pizza place where they would be making us lunch. And they had ordered a dozen pizzas for us and the owners of the restaurant were incredibly gracious and offered free drinks and kept the food coming while we took our break. Um, and it just really felt like we were doing something very positive for this small community in, in Southern Oregon. In the second recovery for that day, um, we approached this house and the, the remains were visible on the surface and I sort of breathed a sigh of relief. And Michelle here is handing the, the, the ashes of our client's husband back to her. Um, she, our client remained standing next to her car and she just kind of stared out at what used to be her home. I asked her if she was okay, and she shook her head. She asked me for a hug and whispered thank you to me. And I will say that, that COVID was really tough during this time. And, you know, on top, of, on top of your house burning down, you also really can't interact with people the way that you used to. And I think it made people very lonely. <laughs> Um, at this time. And um, our last house that day, we were looking for about two tablespoons of ashes in a tiny, tiny heart-shaped container. Um, the dogs had no hits. We had multiple teams of dogs and multiple teams of archaeologists. Um, we were basically digging blind in three to four feet of debris. Um, and this is where I tell you, and when I unwillingly had to accept the fact that we aren't always successful. And shoveling drywall and metal is pretty slow going. And I began to cry out of frustration and, uh, Mike Newland came over to me and put a hand on my shoulder, signaling that it was time to stop and the sun was going down. And despite my feeling that we had let this client down, she was so incredibly grateful for our efforts and for our just trying to find those remains. Another series of recoveries required um, some creativity and communication. Our client could not leave work to meet us on site. So we exchanged text messages to try to figure out how we could help. Um, we identified the water heater, if you guys can read these slides. Um, 
it says they were in a wooden box. Some were in a wooden box and the other was in a tin um, on a shelf of the closet uh, behind the water heater. So we found the water heater and a quick double check from Asha, who was our dog that day, told us that we were in the right place. That's Asha alerting on the remains. Um, we found the tin and the ashes from the box. And this response here from our client really sums up the general feeling from everybody that we helped and definitely buoyed my spirits for my trip back home. Um, here's another testimonial. And Piper is one of the, one of the dogs who um, works with ICF. I, I just want to emphasize how important, um, how important this is, and how much of an impact our efforts have had and have made on those who are recovering from such a huge loss. So not only losing your house, but the idea of losing um, the remains of your loved one is is very tough. So the point here, we have an opportunity to use our archeological skills to assist people in a time of need and to provide hope to communities that are devastated by wildfires. For me, it has become apparent that this is a unique application of archeological skills for a desperately needed service. And we know that the need will continue to grow as fires continue to grow with climate change. And um, who better to answer the call than archeologists and dogs. And I look forward to seeing some of you out there. And uh, here are some information about the Alta Heritage Foundation. And I did go a lot faster than I thought I was going to. <laughs> so I'm ready to answer any questions if anybody has questions. All right, thank you, Natalie. My name is Dante Paranga and I'm the Development and Marketing Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. I'll be moderating the Q&A portion of tonight's discussion. And just as a reminder, you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom control panel. And we will try to answer as many questions as possible. So I think we have a few questions to start. How long does it take to train a forensic dog to find a cremation? Well, I am not the expert on the dog training portion of, of this. And unfortunately I don't have a good answer. And if, if Alex DeGiorgi is on, maybe he could pop something into the chat about how long it takes, but I, I do not know. It's not quick, I can tell you that much. It's, it's not a quick process. And I know it's months, if not years of training. And do you know how many volunteers are, how many archeologists volunteer on this project? Um, there's, there's been, gosh, when we were working on the campfire, I know there were at least probably 50 or 60 just on that one effort. And I know there's a lot more out there who I want to get involved to. Um, so it's archaeologists from all over, all over the state. And ideally, we would have kind of teams and groups of people, different regions um, in California to be able to respond quickly to some of these, some of these fires. So how do archaeologists get involved with this foundation if they're interested? Well, that's an excellent question. 
And um, you can go to the website, which I put up here, the Alta Heritage Foundation website, and you can easily sign up to volunteer there. And you can also easily make donations. Um, everybody that works with the foundation is, is a volunteer. And every time we go out there, it's, uh, you know, 100% volunteers. And the service that we provide is also entirely free to people who need it. And they can, they can also sign up on the website if you need us, if you need help to recover uh, remains. Um, there's, a, there's a form to fill out uh, to make that request as well. We're always looking for volunteers. So on that note, and I totally second this comment, by the way, because I have never cried. We had someone who cried through a Zoom talk before, and this is also, of course, for me. Could you explain a little bit more about the how much time it would take to volunteer? So like what the time commitment is for volunteering? It varies on, because we can only respond when there's a fire. So it's incredibly difficult to predict. Um, if the need is great and we have a lot of a lot of recoveries to do, we try to plan sort of weekends or a long weekend uh, for the campfire and for the Southern Oregon fires. We had kind of weekend rotations where we'd have a Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, so the time commitment is, you know, a day or two days over a long weekend uh, for the for the archaeological volunteers. And how? And then it just yeah, it just depends on when there's a fire and where there's a fire. And how physically intensive is this work? That also varies quite a bit. Um, as you saw, there's there are situations where we approach a site and the ashes are on the surface. And all we have to do is scoop them up into a bag and that's pretty much it. Or as you saw from the other one, we spent two hours, and that was with Alex, he can vouch for this. Um, we spent about two hours clearing debris, um, moving metal and debris and shoveling um, material to clear the spot for us to actually be able to start searching. So um, it can be very physically demanding, and I would say it is more or equally as emotionally demanding as it is physically demanding. And then we have a question. I'm not sure if you know the answer to this, but I'll go ahead and ask it anyway. What are some examples of historic cemeteries where ICF has worked to locate unidentified graves? Mm, I would recommend going to the ICF website. I know they've done some in Northern California and according to the newsletter that just came out, they also worked some um, in the general Southwest in Utah and Arizona and places like that. And they, so, um, there are specific examples on their website. So um, I recommend checking those out first. And we have a couple of comments about how interesting and uh, this talk was and then to thank you for your important work on it. How have the dog's paws protected when climbing through all that debris? So I've had this question before. And again, I'm not the dog specialist, but um, I have been told that if the situation is particularly um, dangerous, there are little booties that they can wear, but I was also told that um, the pads, the dog's pads are so sensitive that they're able to quickly, you know, and they're on four legs, so they're able to quickly adjust and move uh, their weight, shift their weight to avoid any major injuries during all of that, so they can quickly adjust, um, if that helps. <laughs> And then you were speaking about the emotional toll and that it takes on you as well. Do you have some type of training or resources in order to handle the, the psychological toll? Um, other than just sharing as much as possible with people and making sure that we're all there to support each other as we go through it, um, I have no particular um, extra training um, other than just doing it and going through it. Um, being open, being open to, being open to the experience and being able to kind of process all the, all those feelings and emotions that go through, I think is the most critical part. Um, it's, 
it is a challenge, but having a group of people who understand exactly what, what they're going through and being able to, um, like if you have a good crew leader, a good team leader to kind of walk you through each one. And when it's over, you know, really being able to decompress and talk about it definitely helps get through. And is there a shortage of dogs for this project? Or? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I don't I don't know of a particular shortage of dogs. And I do know that Annie just had a litter um, about so nine months ago. Uh, so we may not have a shortage of dogs. Um, but I know that there are programs. And ICF, again, is a good resource to check uh, to inquire about how to, I know some people want to train their own dogs and some people want to just help with their own animals. Um, and so I definitely recommend reaching out to them, to ICF, to um, find out any details about training or the need. We did, tr we did work with teams in Southern Oregon. We are trying to find kind of local people who would be able to respond also quickly. Um, um, again, having kind of regional teams or kind of statewide teams. So we were also working with, with teams, not just from California, um, but again, ICF would be the ones to contact with more specifics about the dog questions. And could you just clarify what the full name of ICF is, what that stands for? The Institute for Canine Forensics. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few more questions. So just a reminder, if you have those questions, drop them in the, in the Q&A. And how did you become involved in this project? That's also a good story. Um, I, I basically just received an email from a coworker who said, hey, Alex is looking for volunteers to go up to the campfire and they need some archeologists. And I just said, well, shoot, I am an archeologist and I'm originally from Northern California and I know Alex, I've known Alex for a long time. And I just thought, well, might as well do something, you know, feel, having that feeling of kind of helplessness, watching all the stuff unfold on TV and watching, watching the fires just like burn and burn and going like, man, is there actually anything that I can do to help other than donate money to the Red Cross? You know, there's, there's gotta be something else. And this opportunity kind of landed in my lap. And so on my birthday, I drove all the way up to Northern California and showed up in the parking lot at the Home Depot and met with Alex and said, at, you know, in Chico. And I said, I'm here, put me to work. And I wouldn't trade it for anything. Well, thank you, Natalie, for this very moving talk and for the work that you do on this project. And thank you to everyone for attending tonight's living room lecture. Just as a reminder, for more information on our upcoming events, you can check our website at sandiegoarchaeology.org. Thank you and good night.